morning everyone and welcome to Worship at Belhelvy. Uh, you may or may not have had one of these. I hope you have. I hope you're well rested if you've managed to be getting away over the summer. But if you haven't had one of these, you've still got one of these. A vocation rather than a vacation. Uh, it's not just ministers, teachers, doctors, lawyers who have vocations. Uh, the argument I want to make this morning is that every single one of us has a vocation, uh, which is about offering up our life and our work uh, to God for his glory and for the sake of his kingdom. So whatever we do in life, whatever stage of life we're at, we can do it in a meaningful way that connects our work with God. That's what we're thinking about uh, this morning in our worship. And we're going to begin now with our first song, which is called How Can I Keep from singing. Let's worship God together. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, as we raise our faces to the sun on a clear autumn day and feel its warmth in our skin, so we lower our heads in prayer, close our eyes, and let the truth of who you are warm the hidden places of our hearts. You are all good, all merciful, all just, and we can trust you. You are our Father, our Lord, and our friend. You are our God and God of those who don't as yet even know your name. And we've gathered here today thankful for what we've known of you, but wanting to know more. And that's why we're here. Father, as we gather for worship today, we recognize how rare these moments of quietness are and how often we miss you 
in the daily round of life. So at the start of this service, we pause deliberately and prayerfully and ask you to help us bring to mind the things that we have been grateful for this past week. Lord, we bless you for all these things. For warm clothes, plentiful food and a roof over our heads. For friendships strengthened, laughter shared and love expressed. For work prepared, tasks finished, and rest that's been well earned. For good news, Troubles shared and unexpected kindnesses. For all these things, we bring you our heartfelt thanks. Lord, each of these we know is a facet of your common grace to all people. And we confess that we take them and you for granted. But when we pause to think about them, we're so grateful for them and the particular ways that you've drawn close to us this week. Thank you that your holiness doesn't detach you from the ordinary, but embeds you even deeper into it. And that when we scratch the surface of our daily living, we always see the glint of you and your activity shining underneath, helping us recognize your presence in every circumstance of life. To realize that your call to follow echoes far beyond the doors of this building. And you call us to know you and make you known, not just in the place of worship, but in the many different places where we work. Help us as we go about our living to keep in tune with your purposes for the world, cultivating peace, patience, kindness, and self-control as a sign of your kingdom and the character of its king. When things are going fine and life seems easy, help us not to forget you. When things are awful and life seems meaningless, help us not to despair of you. When things are ordinary and life just goes on, help us not to ignore you. Forgive us, Father, where we need forgiving. And teach us how to live with you, not at the periphery, but at the center of our lives. So hear our prayers, because we ask them all in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have two readings this morning, uh, both from the New Testament. Uh, John chapter 6 from verse 25, and then Colossians chapter 3 from verse 23. And Meg Duncan is going to read for us. And the readings are from the New International Version of the Bible. John chapter 6. Jesus, the bread of life. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And the reading from Colossians, chapter 3. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord 
as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Amen. Lord, as we gather here today with these uh, symbols of bread and wine before us, we recognize what you gave up, not just in order to be with us, but in order to redeem us, to give your life for ours, that we might be set free to become all that we can be and will be in you. So Lord, help us today as we hear your word, as we eat this supper together, to take the next small step of faith and trust on our journey, whatever it might be, whether that's stepping into faith for the first time, whether that's taking another step on what has already been a long journey. Speak to us through your Spirit that we might know what you're asking of us today and put it into practice beyond these walls. Amen. Back in the day, there were three folk who tended to be held in particular esteem within their communities because of their profession. The teacher, the doctor, and the minister. And these were men, and in those days they mostly were men, who were understood to have a vocation, a calling to a particular role in society which involved learning, a degree of selflessness, and a commitment to place and people which blurred the boundaries between the professional and the personal. They weren't just doing a job, they had chosen a way of life, often at some considerable personal cost. I remember being at a wedding quite a long time ago now, not long after I had decided to ditch chemistry and train to be a minister, which was a big decision and a big watershed in my life. And Rona and I were sitting opposite a nice young couple, and we got into conversation with them when we were talking about this, and the guy was really interested to hear my story. How had I decided to, to change direction? What were the signs that this was the right way to go? And all the time I was chatting to him, and enthusing about finally finding what it was that I wanted to do, I could see his girlfriend glowering at me. At, glowering at me. She was sh literally shooting daggers at me with her eyes. And I thought, what have I done? But about half an hour into the conversation, it became clear that these were live issues for this young man because he was a Roman Catholic and he was thinking of joining the priesthood. Small wonder she wasn't the best pleased. Like I say, vocation often comes at a cost. Now, in our day and age, the thinking about who has a vocation has widened a little. It didn't take me long after moving here to realize that farming's a vocation. It's a way of life. You're always at your work, and your work's never done. You don't clock in and clock out, and you're constantly on call, especially in the springtime when you're calving and you're, or you're lambing. And you have this deep connection with place, and with people that goes way back, in many cases, for generations. And motherhood's a vocation, although it's often an undervalued one in today's society, where we seem to need either one very good wage or two reasonable ones to get by with some degree of comfort. Mothers, you too are always at your work. You're constantly on call. Your labors are labors of love, and most of the time, you set about them with remarkable selflessness. And we could go on. But for all that the definition has widened a little over the years to include other kinds of work and workers, we still have this quite narrow idea of what a vocation is. It's a demanding call that comes to some people and not to others. Some of us have vocations. The rest of us just have work to do. And that's the thinking that Fruitfulness in the Front Line wants to challenge this morning. Because whatever tasks fall to us, no matter how menial, we can choose to see them as vocational, part of God's call on our lives. And we can choose to do those tasks in a way that reflects the values of God's kingdom 
and that brings honor to God's name. You can, with the right mindset, sweep a floor in that way, or mend a car in that way, or buy and sell at the mart in that way, or prepare a meal in that way, or look after your grandchildren in that way. Approached in the right spirit and responding to the call of God in our lives, any work that we do can be fruitful in as much as it reflects the values of God's kingdom and brings honor to God's name. But we might need to change our mindsets a little to see it that way. So let me set the scene for you a wee bit this morning. Here's a question. Why, according to Genesis 1, did God create Adam on day 6 rather than on day 1? And I'll not embarrass you by asking for an answer. Because the answer is, if he'd created him on day 1, it would have been pitch black and he would have had nowhere to stand. Adam and Eve, according to the story, enter Eden once everything else is in place. Everything that they needed for living. God created an environment where human flourishing was possible and then he sent them out into that environment not just to enjoy it, but to work at it. To bring about that flourishing through their actions in the world under his guidance. So work, believe it or not, like it or not, work was always part of the plan right from the beginning. Even before the fall, work was and is good. And at our best, we still know that, even though we might all be scunnered to work from time to time. When we see a project come together, or we smell and taste a meal that we've prepared and see others enjoy it, or turn the key and hear the engine that we fixed kick back into life, or see the field begin to turn from brown to green as the shoots begin to push through the soil, we feel a rightness about it, a goodness in our bones. Why? Because God wants his world to flourish. And that's what we're doing. What we're doing, small though it might be, is a part of that flourishing. These little tasks take their place in a much bigger movement that started in the heart of God at the beginning of time and will reach its fulfillment when the kingdom finally comes. God is working for the restoration, the healing, the blessing of all things. And by the grace of God, we get to play our part in that great movement as well. We get to show now, through our work, what the coming kingdom will look like. And that's possible in even the most lowly of tasks that we do. When a supermarket worker stacks the shelves thoughtfully, with the labels facing out the way so people can find what they need more easily. That's reflecting God's order and care. When binmen collect the rubbish carefully so they don't leave mess on your driveway, that's reflecting God's care for creation. When you change that nappy promptly so your grandchild doesn't suffer from nappy rash, that reflects God's selfless love and compassion. Or when you make yet another packed lunch, or tidy away the dishes, or shovel snow off your neighbor's driveway, or clear up in the Forsyth Hall after coffee time, ready for the next group, you're reflecting something of the goodness and the generosity of God. Just small things, I know. But they're actions that carry within them the values of the kingdom. Where what matters is not just that I flourish, but that the whole human family flourishes because that is what's at the heart of our Father God. Beginning to see our work in that bigger context can start to make all the difference. There's a story that's told about a nobleman who was visiting the construction work on a great church that was being built in his city. 
And he approached one of the stone workers and he asked him what he was doing. Oh, I'm building a wall, he said. And across the way was another man who was doing exactly the same work. But when the nobleman stopped with him and asked him what he was doing, the man smiled and he said, oh, I'm helping build a cathedral. Building a wall. Building a cathedral. Same work. Different attitude. And when we start to see the work that we do as a participation in God's grand design of making the world more like his kingdom, that's when it starts to feel different. With that as a background, even the most menial, down-to-earth tasks take on a significance that they wouldn't otherwise have had. They matter because they align with God's purpose to bless and to redeem his world. And they matter because as we go about them, we have a chance to reflect God's character to the people around us and so bring him honor. Among the stories that were trotted out at my dad's funeral was one about his days working in retail when he managed the furniture and the carpet departments of a big local department store in Ballymena. And my dad was very good at his job, but his boss, Mr. Stacy, didn't always recognize that or give him the credit that he deserved. And then one day, I think it was a weekend when the shop was especially busy, Mr. Stacy decided that he would help things along by attending to some of the customers himself. So he came down onto the shop floor and he approached one lady and said, can I help you, madam? And she said, no, it's, it's fine, thanks. I'm, I'm waiting for Bob. And he went up to another lady and said, can I help you, madam? And she said, no, it's okay, Mr. Stacy, thank you, but I'm, I'm waiting for Bob. And he tried a third lady and she said, well, Mr. Stacy, if it's all the same to you, I think I would rather wait for Bob. Now, my father was a good looking man who bore more than a passing resemblance to Clark Gable in a certain light. I didn't inherit those looks, unfortunately, but that wasn't what they were waiting for. They were waiting for Bob because they knew that he would treat them respectfully and fairly. And he understood that in a market town, the price on the label was never the price that was paid. And he was willing to bend a wee bit in order to close a deal, leaving both parties happy. He had that reputation and people knew it. They trusted my dad because they knew his character. So how does your character come across in the work that you do? How does it reflect on the God that you say you worship? Because people may know that you are a Christian or that you go to church. Are you consistent or are you unpredictable? Are you the same person outside the kirk as you are in it? Does your character attract people and inspire trust? Or do they have to tiptoe around you depending on what kind of mood they find you in that day? It's worth reflecting on the truth that it's not just what we do in life that matters. It's how we do it that shows what we really are. Keith's story is a good illustration of that. Keith was a self-employed painter and decorator for 10 years, and he himself admitted that in those days all he was really interested in was making as much money out of his work as he could. He had a faith, but it didn't really come into his work life much at all. But then he was in a serious car crash, and his gratitude to God for surviving it brought on a, the beginnings of a change in perspective. He still wanted to earn lots of money, but only so he could give a good chunk of it away, which was better, but still not quite there. Work for him was still just a means to an end, not a vocation as such. And then after a particular church service, the light started to go on for Keith. He began to understand that his work was about more than just earning money. He realized that when he was decorating for people, he was helping them to live the lives that they had to lead. 
He was helping a woman who was looking after her sick husband because she didn't have time to decorate so he could help by offering his services. He was helping an older man who'd reached the point in his life where he just couldn't manage DIY anymore. The house needed done, but he couldn't do it. So Keith was able to help him. He helped another family with a disabled child to work out how to make a home that really worked for them, given that child's limitations. He was serving God by serving people. He wasn't really doing anything different in his actual work, but his mindset had changed completely. He wasn't just working any longer simply to make money or even to make money so he could give a chunk of it away. He discovered his actual vocation right there in the middle of the work he'd been doing for years. Right there as a painter and decorator. He could reflect the values of God's kingdom and he could bring honor to God's name in the way he approached his daily work. I hope you're beginning to get the picture on this particular Sunday. We tend to cordon off the spiritual parts of our lives from the secular parts. There's the church and prayer and spiritual reading and all of that stuff. And then over here, there's the rest of life, so much of which is given over to work. And I want to tell you this morning that God knows nothing of that distinction. There is no divide between the sacred and the secular. They all blur into one. And if we're wearing the right glasses, we come to see all of life as sacred. Because all of life is about answering that central call of Jesus Christ, which is come and follow me. Follow me as you worship, yes, but also as you work. We don't leave God at the door of the workplace. What must we do To do the works God requires. That's what the people say to Jesus as they gather around him in today's gospel story. Looking for more bread, possibly, or another miracle. And they're really asking, what does God want from us? What's he calling us to do? Feed the poor? Save the world? Keep our noses clean? Fight the Romans? What's the big picture? And Jesus' answer is, the work God has given you to do is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And you've heard me say it often enough to know that believe in that sentence isn't just about agreeing with a set of ideas about God, at least not just that. It's about trust. The overarching work that God has given you to do, your main vocation in life before all others, is to learn to trust in the one he has sent. Trust that the love that took him to the cross in self-surrender is extravagantly, unconditionally yours without your earning it or working for it or even deserving it. That's a thing that we call grace. God's inexplicable love aimed four square at every man and woman in the whole of creation, not because we merit it, but because he knows that that kind of love is the only way to mend us. Trust him when he says that. Trust that to give your life into his hands with the kind of abandon that he expects of disciples isn't going to mean the end of your life, but the beginning of it. Trust that what seems like foolishness to the world, the way of Christ and the cross, is actually the wisdom of God for the salvation of the world. And trust that there is a place in His plan for you, in all your uniqueness, where all that you love and all that you treasure and are enthused by can be taken up and used by Him as a sign and a blessing to the world. So whether it's farming or flower arranging, 
teaching or caring, planning or organizing, child rearing or volunteering, whatever in life your work might look like just now, give thanks to God for it. And remember to give it back to God, however you can, for His glory and for the sake of His kingdom. Amen. Let's come before God in prayer now. Let us pray together. Father, thank you for your word to us today, affirming the gift of our lives as they truly are and your desire to help us live them well and wisely. These are such difficult times we're living through when so much is in transition and there's so much uncertainty. And though we're just as caught up in it as the next person, thank you that faith helps us see things from a different perspective, remembering that ultimately you are in charge and your will shall be done and your spirit is with us to guide, sustain and correct if we take the time to genuinely listen. Lord, thank you for our vocation whatever it might be, for drawing us as the people we are into your ongoing work in the world, making us partners with you in your kingdom work. Thank you that whether we're laying bricks or baking scones, helping with homework or driving a combine, putting heart, body, soul and mind into what we do or taking it easier because our busier days are behind us. Whatever our circumstances, you can take and use our lives and our work in your service, showing through how we are and what we do something of your grace and goodness in the world. So Lord, help us to see our work with fresh eyes, not just as a means of putting food on the table or getting the things we want to have in life, but as a participation in your life, which you are always giving up for the sake of the world. Lord, help us find new meaning in the menial tasks that fill our days. Help us bring kingdom values to the business table and to the bottom line. Help us show your nature in how we go about the work you've called us to at this stage of our lives so we might make a real difference in our places of work and our communities. Lord, as we think of workers and vocations, we remember again those working so hard to combat the spread of coronavirus, thanking you and them for all of their efforts. But we remember too those struggling to make businesses work in these unpredictable times and those whose jobs are on the line or may already have gone. Help them make wise decisions. Keep them from despair and bring new opportunities into their lives, we pray. We remember our young people as they return to school and the staff who've been working so hard to prepare for them coming back. Be with those who are moving up to academy for the first time and trying to settle into a new school and those transitioning into work or further education in the midst of all this change. We take a moment to remember the stories that have been in the headlines this week and the lives affected by them. The train derailment at Stonehaven. The ammonium nitrate blast in Beirut. The sinister progress of COVID in the developing nations and the political fallout from the COVID response in the developed nations. And we remember to those near and dear to us who are especially on our hearts and minds this morning. And we take a moment in silence to bring these situations and these people before you, asking you to uphold them and give them the help that they need.
Lord, as we ask you to answer our prayers, help us not to be slow in answering your call. Your call to live our lives in all their ordinariness, in communion with you, our Saviour and our God. So hear our prayers because we ask them all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's been a, a big week for the boys and girls as they've returned to school after a long wait. Uh, so I hope that you're all uh, settling in, finding your way around, those of you who are at new schools. Uh, and I'm sure you're enjoying just being back with your friends again after such a long time away. Uh, so it's been great to see the pictures of you that have been put up on Facebook. And we're going to have a look at some of them now as you've started back this week. Closing hymn this morning is Lord of all hopefulness. Let's worship God together. And now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. <laughs>